Hi, today happened to be a hot day, and it's the right time for grilling this carbon containing meat with the help of pure carbon in order for this carbon containing body to finally be able to breathe out some carbon dioxide. Why so much carbon, you may wonder? Hmm. Well, let's find out. Quite often, during some regular experiment, when I mix one with another, or for example set something on fire, I remember my favorite fantasy worlds. That's probably why I like Raid Shadow Legends. There is a very nice thick fantasy atmosphere, a lot of champions with their own unique skills and epic bosses, fight with which are remembered for a long time. But I especially like High Elves in Raid. They have a long and rich history here. And at the moment, the Kingdom of Avera is the most beautiful and powerful country in the world of Raid Shadow Legends. My favorite champion from the High Elves faction is Vergis. He holds damage well and places useful buffs on his allies. Anyway, the game is immersive in itself and does not forget to develop. Recently a new faction has appeared here, the Sylvian Watchers. It includes forest elves, ants, druids and fairs. I haven't played them yet, but I definitely will. Moreover, a new season of Forge Pass has already started. You can get the most powerful equipment that has ever been in the game. Also, if you are an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. So if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the video description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you'll get unique bonuses for $30. I mean a free epic champion Vergis, 200k silver, 1 energy refill and 1 xp boost and 1 ancient shot so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in the game. I think many of you, just like me, come into contact with carbon every day, whether it be writing something with a pencil on a sheet of paper or wearing a ring with a precious stone on your finger. But wait, do pencil leads and diamonds really share something in common? And I'll say yes, they do. That's because both of them consist of the same element, which is carbon. It's fair to say that in nature this element takes the lead in disguising itself as the most unusual and expensive thing. For instance, I grilled the shashlik using pure carbon in the form of charcoal. You can also use graphite, which also consists of carbon, to write on a sheet of paper. And the strongest and hardest natural material diamond also consists of pure carbon. All of this is a result of a property called allotrophy, which allows one chemical element to take different forms, changing the location of atoms within a crystalline grid of a certain chemical, and carbon takes the lead in this. To make it more understandable, let's take some regular charcoal, which mostly consists of pure carbon, that is loosely distributed carbon atoms bound together by weak double bonds, which makes the molecular structure of a piece of charcoal look not so robust. It is this property which makes charcoal have such a high chemical activity. In other words, it burns well in the air and easily reacts with other chemicals, for instance with oxygen from the air. Besides oxygen, charcoal also reacts well with some oxidizers, for instance such as ammonium nitrate. That's why sometimes I like adding some ammonium nitrate to the leftover shashlik charcoal, which makes all the charcoal burn out instantaneously without leaving a mark, because the reaction products of ammonium nitrate and charcoal are purely gaseous. But still besides charcoal, which produces heat to suitable for grilling shashlik, there exists another form of carbon, which is graphite. Carbon atoms in graphite have a more organized structure. In turn, this has a significant impact on the properties of the obtained material. Graphite is not as fragile and soft as charcoal, and when attempts are made to burn it, graphite doesn't react with oxygen from the air that well. For instance, if you try to burn a regular pencil in pure oxygen, then wood will burn well, 
just as it's supposed to. And the only thing that will be left after burning the pencil is graphite lead, which burns very poorly even in the stream of pure oxygen. The only time when you can see graphite burn is when it is burned at a very high temperature. For instance, when copper is melted in a graphite crucible. As soon as graphite starts coming into contact with oxygen from the air, it immediately starts burning with a hardly visible bluish flame, and it looks quite stunning. It's a pity through that this spectacular occurrence is quite expensive, because flame gradually reduces the thickness of a graphite crucible, and in some time it will need to be replaced. But still, in my opinion, graphite crucibles are the most suitable crucibles for melting metals, because no metal sticks to them, which is why I only use graphite molds for making metal nuggets. Besides its low chemical activity and high thermal conductivity, graphite also conducts electric current well, which is why it's used to make current collectors in trolley buses or electrodes in batteries. It is noteworthy that besides regular graphite, which is synthesized by heating up coke or almost pure carbon with vestiges of petroleum refining processes, there also exists so-called pyrolytic carbon, which is synthesized by heating up butane or propane to 1500 degrees Celsius in vacuum. This method of synthesis makes the properties of such obtained graphite more similar to those of a recently discovered graphene. For instance, thermal conductivity of pyrolytic carbon carbon is several times higher than that of regular graphite, which is why, if you hold a piece of such graphite in your hand, you can easily slice through ice cubes with the warmth of your hand. Besides having higher thermal and electric conductivity, such graphite is also the best diamagnetic material in the world. In other words, it gets repelled by any magnetic field. For instance, if you take 9 magnets linked a special way and put a pyrolytic carbon circle on them, it will be able to levitate almost indefinitely until the magnetic field ceases to exist. Of course, the levitation isn't very strong and can hardly be compared to quantum locking, but still such a levitating circle can even hold a small weight. Besides thin pyrolytic circles, I also managed to get this thick piece of pyrolytic graphite at auction. With it, levitation should look even more impressive. For this purpose, I assembled such a setup with three neodymium magnets suspended above the piece of graphite. Now I am putting a small neodymium magnet on the surface of the pyrolytic graphite. What we are observing is suspended in mid-air. Because there are magnets above it, they are trying to pull this small magnet cube, which is suspended above the surface by the magnetic force, pushing it away from the piece of graphite. Thus, we can imitate quantum locking even at room temperature and without using liquid nitrogen. Also, we can use this piece of pyrolytic graphite to produce graphene itself by just peeling off layer after layer. The obtained graphene has the highest thermal conductivity in the world and can even be used to make the most efficient thermal paste in the world in the future. It will be even more efficient than a liquid metal consisting of an alloy of indium and gallium. However, even the expensive graphene consisting 10 euros for 1 gram, cannot be compared to the enormous price of another form of carbon, which is diamond. Because all carbon atoms in diamond crystalline grid are connected with each other, their strong structure gives this material amazing properties. Besides being the hardest natural known substance on the Earth, diamonds also have extremely high thermal conductivity and the highest refractive index. This is precisely why cut diamonds shine so intensively when light by direct sunlight. However, no you are seeing not a real diamond, but rather cut monosanite crystals, which are synthetic silicon carbides, in other words compounds of carbon and silicon. 
such fake diamonds cause hundreds of times less than real diamonds and it's extremely hard to distinguish them from real diamonds with the naked eye because of their similar refractive indexes. So why are rings with diamonds are so expensive in shops? Because it seems like besides being extremely hard, there is nothing else remarkable about these carbon crystals. That's because of the monopolistic company called D Beers which in the early 20th century controlled 97% of all mined diamonds in the world, which is why it could set any prices for the shiny pieces of carbon. After the hugely successful campaign called A Diamond is Forever, run by De Beers in the 1940s, cut diamonds turned from luxury products into traditional gifts without which nowadays it's hard to imagine weddings and engagements. That's why I advise all my viewers not to be tricked by the monopolists and not to buy the overpriced pieces of carbon, which can hardly be used for anything else besides cutting glass. Speaking of glass cutting, mostly synthetic diamonds are used in this industry and they are not as overpriced as the naturally occurring diamonds, although their properties are just the same as those of their hugely expensive fellow diamonds. For instance, a polycrystalline diamond is used in this glass cutter and it almost doesn't get blunt and can cut glass for many years. Also nowadays, synthetic diamonds are widely used as abrasive materials, for instance, in soles used for serving glass and concrete. Artificial diamonds consist of the very same carbon and it's almost impossible to visually distinguish a real diamond from a well-made synthetic diamond. But still most synthetic diamonds have a yellowish tint because of nitrogen impurities in their crystalline grid. If you happen to have a white artificial diamond, there are two ways you can distinguish it from a real one. The first method is the easiest. You need to point ultraviolet light at both stones. For instance, here I have mixed up some natural diamonds with artificial ones and also with mosonites. We can see that some natural diamonds containing boron impurities are shining in the ultraviolet light. These ones are certainly real. After that, you need to completely switch off the light and light all the diamonds with ultraviolet light as intensely as possible. Real carbon diamonds will be glowing with faint reddish color, which shows that they are made of pure carbon. For instance, mosonite won't glow no matter how long you point ultraviolet light at it, which shows that it's fake. It's noteworthy that depending on their impurities, many diamonds glow highly brightly and beautifully in ultraviolet light as can be seen from this stand in the Natural History Museum in London. I even dread to imagine the price of this collection. Besides using an UV light torch, there is another method of telling if a diamond is real. It's such a device for testing precious stones. For comparison purposes, I laid out two natural diamonds, one artificial diamond, a mosonite, a sapphire and an extremely hard zirconium oxide bearing in a row. Also for comparison purposes, at the end of the row I added a piece of regular graphite. Upon conducting first test, the genuineness of the first two diamonds was confirmed, just as it was supposed to be, and the device showed the maximum reading. I didn't get what exactly the device measured, maybe it was thermal or electrical conductivity. After that, I checked the small synthetic diamond, and the reading was lower than that of the natural diamonds. That's why you can distinguish synthetic diamonds from natural ones using this method. It's worthy of note that when I tested the mosonite, the device indicated that it's a diamond, and the same thing happened when I tested the sapphire, which like diamond has high hardness and thermal conductivity. The only thing that was detected as fake was ceramic bearing, and it even came as a surprise. The device also couldn't distinguish graphite from a natural diamond, which is my opinion at least partly suggests that the device is useless. Evidently, to confirm the genuineness of a diamond, two methods need to be used, which means that the testing device needs to be using, then an UV light torch and perhaps density of the precious stones will need to be measured too for more precise results. Nevertheless, just as I said earlier, graphite, carbon and diamonds are made of carbon atoms, as the only difference is the inner structure of the substance. That's why, just like regular coal, diamonds are supposed to burn well. I decided to run an experiment to test this property. I took a quartz tube and put three small diamonds into it and started blowing pure oxygen through it. 
to make the diamonds burn, I am heating up this section of the tube with a gas burner, and after that, what's left is just to wait. Some time later, the temperature reached a critical point, and the first diamond started burning with a highly bright yellow flame, and started looking more like a nugget of scorched metal than a burning substance. The other diamond started burning too, several seconds later. Turns out diamonds in a stream of pure oxygen burn just as well as coal, and just several seconds later, these three precious stones vanished without a trace. As a result, no matter how expensive and beautiful a cut diamond is, it can easily be burned, and thousands of euros can be turned into a small amount of carbon dioxide, which costs almost nothing. It's noteworthy that diamonds on Earth were formed out of ancient carbon dioxide, which in the course of a million of years sank from the Earth's atmosphere into various minerals and hydrocarbons, which under the influence of enormous pressure and heat at the depth of half a kilometer turned into one of today's most precious stones on the Earth. Since we have mentioned the so-called carbon circle, let's see how carbon dioxide could form not only diamonds, but also entire rock masses from carbon deposits. The thing is, about 4 billion years ago, after our planet cooled off, the young Earth's atmosphere was up to 20% carbon dioxide. That's why it was impossible to breathe on Earth at that time. Because of such a high concentration of carbon dioxide in the air, it dissolved very well in seawater. That's why ancient oceans taste like slightly carbonated water. Along with that, many minerals, for instance minerals containing calcium ions, were washed away from the young Earth's crust. By the way, they reacted well with the slightly carbonated water, in fact, just as well as the process of enriching calcium hydroxide solution with carbon dioxide. As a result, the reaction produces calcium carbonate or limestone, and in the course of millions of years, they formed huge rock masses all over the world. In some places, this process is still happening. For instance, in Turkish Pamukkale, water rich with carbon dioxide and calcium compounds dries and leaves behind snow white limestone deposits, which look like something otherworldly. As a result, the deposited sediment feels like chalk to the touch, which in the course of millions of years, shaped by pressure and heat, can turn into marble, which like chalk, consists of calcium carbonate. When reacting with certain acids, for instance such as hydrochloric acid, marble can produce carbon dioxide. This is how the lesser carbon circle closed on the ancient young earth. The obtained carbon dioxide is much heavier than air, and it can easily be collected into a regular beaker. I think you already know that carbon dioxide hinders burning, because carbon in its composition is already oxidized. That's why a mesh very quickly blows out in such a medium. However, for other chemicals, this medium can be even better than regular air, for instance for magnesium. If you ignite magnesium in the air, it will burn with a very bright flame, simply burning into magnesium oxide. But if you do the same thing in carbon dioxide medium, the magnesium will burn even brighter, robbing carbon dioxide of oxygen and turning it into a regular carbon. It's worthy of note that it is possible to transition carbon dioxide from a gaseous state to a solid state, making so-called dry ice, which will never melt under atmospheric pressure. That's because of the special phase diagrams of carbon dioxide, which can be in a liquid state only under the immense pressure of about 70 atmospheric pressures, like in this ampule. It is noteworthy that if we slightly heat this ampule with a hair dryer to 40 degrees Celsius, then the carbon dioxide will transition to a rather unusual supercritical point, becoming neither gas nor liquid. After cooling off, the substance turns into liquid carbon dioxide again, which looks quite mesmerizing. In the air, solid carbon dioxide immediately turns into gas. This process is also known as sublimation, which is why it's called dry. The reaction between dry ice and water is quite beautiful. It creates thick fog made of water vapor and cold carbon dioxide. 
When running such experiments, it's important to ventilate the facility well, because in large amounts carbon dioxide is hazardous to people. But still, for instance, for such metals as magnesium, dry ice is the best medium for burning, because when ignited along with dry ice, magnesium turns into a sort of miniature sun. The temperature of this reaction was so high that it even set my background on fire. That's why I don't advise you to repeat such experiments. Besides magnesium, some living creatures also like carbon dioxide on our young planet. For instance, two and a half billion years ago, the first cyanobacteria on the Earth appeared, and they started using carbon dioxide and water as a source of energy, and started multiplying rapidly in the medium of concentrated carbon dioxide on our planet. It is worthy of note that this is what harmed them, because the oxygen released by cyanobacteria as a result of photosynthesis turned out to be toxic for them, which is why back then there happened an oxygen revolution on the Earth, which significantly changed the biosphere on the young Earth. It is noteworthy that besides playing a part in the creation of many forms of living organisms, carbon also formed these organisms, binding with other items of such elements as for instance nitrogen, hydrogen and sulfur. But why is carbon still the main building block of all living organisms on the Earth? For instance, why it is not silicon, which is from the same group of elements as carbon, and which is even more abundant than carbon? The thing is, from all chemical elements, it is only carbon that can create so many stable chemical bonds with other elements. For instance, a bond between carbon atom is rather thermodynamically stable, just as bonds between hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen atoms. That is why many carbon-containing organic substances are highly stable and do not break down not when affected by heat like a mixture of heavy hydrocarbons called oil tar which is used to make asphalt. Besides forming four single bonds, carbon can also form double, triple and even polycyclic bonds, in which this chemical element will be the main linking element. Furthermore, the property of carbon to form both soluble and insoluble compounds in water came in handy in the creation of life, which gave an incredible diversity and wideness for evolution processes, because of which we have evolved from simplest bacteria as a result of billions of years of competition between molecules. Speaking of silicon, this chemical element doesn't stand a chance in competing with the chemical diversity of carbon. For example, the bonds between silicon atoms are weaker than those between carbon atoms, and silicon doesn't even bond with hydrogen that well. For instance, if you add sulfuric acid to such a compound as magnesium silicide, the reaction between them will release a gas called silane, which is made of silicon atoms bound with four hydrogen atoms. In the air, this gas is highly unstable and immediately self-ignites, turning into silicon dioxide or into regular sand in the form of smoke, because the bonds between silicon and oxygen atoms are much stronger. By comparison, methane, which is found in natural gas and consists of hydrogen and carbon atoms, is highly stable in the air. That's why, unlike silen, it easily volatilizes and don't self-ignite when we turn out the stove burner. Of course, I can give hundreds more examples and make this video significantly longer, but it comes down to the fact that the existence of silicon-based life is impossible in our conditions. Maybe this could be possible on other planets in some highly strange conditions, but as a chemist I am highly skeptical about it, just because in accordance with the laws of physics and chemistry, carbon has a huge amount of advantages over silicon. Just like in real life, those who adapt better are also those who win, and in this other elements are simply no match for carbon. Nevertheless, carbon can create bonds not just with non-metals, but also with some active metals. For instance, if you take a mixture of activated carbon and magnesium powder and heat it up, then they will form magnesium carbide, with properties slightly similar to those of well-known calcium carbide, which when reacting with water, releases a flammable gas called acetylene. Thus, I obtained an organic carbon compound using the reaction of an inorganic compound with water, which is yet another class of chemicals for which carbon plays a major role. The thing is, our entire civilization also owes our high living standards to carbon, or rather to those very hydrocarbons, which we extract from the Earth's interior every day. 
oil, natural gas and coal are huge energy sources in the form of reduced carbon. That's why this element happened to be very useful in this respect too. It's a pity for that in the last 100 years humanity has got so used to using this readily available energy source that we have completely forgotten about the reaction products of burning hydrocarbons, that is about water and carbon dioxide, which have accumulated in rather large quantities in the atmosphere in recent years, creating the greenhouse effect on the Earth. It's not worthy that in their last report the US government mentioned global warming caused by the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as one of the main threats to America, rather than the threat of a possible nuclear catastrophe and the current events. That's why it's rather ironic how after giving us life, carbon can take it away from us if we treat it not so seriously. So, I think after watching this video you'll know more about such an element as carbon. And if you liked it, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting videos.